Hello, and welcome to another installment of Writer's Commentary for the Batman Beyond chapter, printed in DC Comics' Batman Beyond Unlimited number 9, where we take you behind the scenes a bit to give you a little extra window into the comic you've bought. Howard Porter and John Livesay drew our cover, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing John's last name wrong, but I have never met John. I admire his work, however. Uh, I'm Adam Beechin, the book's writer. Norm Brayfogle is our artist. Andy Elder, our colorist. Saida Tamafonte, our letterer, Sarah Gatos, our assistant editor, and Ben Abernathy, our editor. Since we've got just 10 pages of, uh, of story this month, uh, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Uh, our storyline, 10,000 Clowns, is in full swing right now, and if you've missed previous chapters, they're easily available to you either digitally at comicsology.com or in print at your local comic shop. Uh, this chapter is called All Hands, as in All Hands on Deck, and the overriding aim of the chapter is to show the Bat family coming back together uh, to deal with uh, the current crisis that Gotham finds itself in. Uh, if you haven't uh, read this chapter already, you may want to pause this now and go ahead and read it, otherwise I'm about to spoil it big time for you. Here on page two, we're getting to something essential about this new Catwoman. She's not a bad person. We saw some of that in, our, in her first appearance back in the Hush Beyond miniseries, but now we're learning that she has almost as much affection for Gotham as Batman does. Right here, Batman neatly sums up the confounding nature of this crisis. Uh, they're up against bad guys who clearly have a plan and know what they're doing, but how do you stop them when they refuse to tell you what they want and you can't get a grip on where or how they'll strike next? It's a pretty terrifying circumstance to be in, I imagine, and uh, hopefully this chapter starts to show some of Terry's desperation coming out. On the next page, more the magnitude of the situation. 91 bombings in Gotham City in what can't be more than just a couple of hours. The situation is bad and getting worse, urgent and getting more urgent. And our guys just don't have the first hint of a lead yet. And now's a good time to mention that we don't see the Joker King at all in this chapter. He and Batman have yet to meet. That's how well he's planned this out. His plan has already essentially been executed, and he hasn't given Batman even the slightest opportunity to put him out of commission. How many other supervillains run their show like that? The point is, this guy's smart, and Batman's taken notice. If Gotham survives all of this, will other criminals take the Joker King's style as a model? Also, Catwoman sums herself up well here. She's a thief, not a vulture. You could make the argument she could just head for a city that doesn't have metacrime like this and made her living there, but you could say that about every metacriminal, right? What is it that keeps them all so close to home? It might be something really worth exploring at some point. Now here on page 5 is yet another example of why I'm so lucky to work with Norm. A lot of times, the hero in the mask doesn't resemble the secret identity without the mask. With an artist of Norm's caliber, the facial expressions of the superhero are exactly the same as the secret identity. We both work really hard to never forget that it's Terry McGinnis under the suit. My job is to make sure the lines of thinking and the dialogue styles are the same, while Norm's is to make sure the physiology, the posture, and the expressions are the same. It humanizes our hero and brings his two sides together for the reader to identify with. My favorite example of this is how Steve Ditko drew Peter Parker in Spider-Man. Spidey wasn't some muscle-bound lunk because Peter wasn't. Peter was gangly and awkward, and Spidey, though graceful, was likewise stick-thin and had arms and legs flailing all over the place. You never felt like Peter and Spidey were two different characters. Here's what's hopefully the gut-punch surprise of the chapter, the reintroduction of Tim Drake. If you haven't seen the animated special The Return of the Joker, which I highly recommend, let's just say Tim had some experiences that made him highly averse to interacting with our cast, and now he's being called upon to do so. His eyes are wide open and fearful, and his posture is totally rigid. I imagine he gets like this every time the name Batman is so much as even mentioned. On page six, we bring in two more of our characters. Now naturally, Commissioner Barbara Gordon would be very active during all of this, and here she makes her first contact with one of our newest characters, the new Vigilante. It's also our first chance to see Vigilante, in costume, dispense his brand of justice on his own. Obviously, we're putting a spin on the classic scene in Watchmen, where Rorschach breaks the thug's finger, and it's same shot, same angle panels, where all that changes is Rorschach's and the thug's hands changing position, and the expression on the thug's face registering pain. Here, we're playing the violence off-panel, with increasingly large sound effects and the Joker's expression going from horror to agony to shock. In the next panel, we see the results of Vigilante's action, before he delivers his philosophy to the commissioner. On page 8, Terry makes his desperate plea, and Tim Drake gives his equally impassioned refusal. Check out Batman's shaking hand at the bottom left. He's taking the only shots he can take, and he needs them to happen, badly. Tim hangs up on him, but his head is down. One, because you never really leave the Bat family, especially if you're not a true hero dedicated to helping others, which Tim is. That never leaves you, no matter how hard you try to distance yourself from it. 
He's already reluctantly joined Wayne Incorporated in an earlier issue, and now he's faced with returning to the Batcave, the site of so much psychic trauma for him. And two, maybe, just maybe, he's hanging his head because he's just heard that Bruce is dying. And for all the anger Tim has towards his former mentor, this news has to sadden him. Last page. Dick Grayson's back. His city needs him, and he's taking charge. Or he thinks he is. He's got as much animosity towards Bruce as Tim does, but when the city needs him, he's going to be there. He's invested too many years in keeping it around to let it go boom. So, by the end of the chapter, we've drawn all of our supporting cast, except Max Gibson, who's got her own thing going on, back into the story. We've been working towards that for many chapters now, so if it seems like we've had a lot of action so far, imagine how much more there is to come with all these folks in place. It's going to be big. That's it for now, except to say thanks for checking out the book and for checking out these video casts. Uh, there are more like them elsewhere uh, on this page if you're interested in learning more. Uh, if you have questions, uh, feel free to send them to batmanbeyond at gmail.com. We'll put the address up here in a second. Uh, and uh, if you like what you're seeing, we hope that you'll, uh, you'll tell a friend. Uh, thanks again, and we will see you next month.